All right, so we are in the thick of this uh, this series on our core belief statement. Who here remembers what we talked about last week? What was it? We talked about someone's return. Jesus, Jesus return. Before that, we talked about Trinity. So just make sure we're we're tracking. Last week we said Jesus is coming back as a as a as a, a flying fluffy cloud. No, he's coming back, and we're gonna be we're gonna be resurrected from the dead as angels, right? No, we're gonna have a body. And on the day that Jesus returns, he's coming back as king, he's coming back as boss, and he will judge. He will judge. So we talked about that last week. This week we're moving on to our core belief statement about humanity. Does anyone here know any humans? I hope so. I'm sorry if you do. Maybe it's not very pleasant for you. But this time we're talking about a core belief statement of humanity. We're a church. We're, we're not just like a, a YMCA or a social club. We do things together that are fun. We, we, we have cleaning days and we have kitchen shower days and we have uh, any sort of crazy event, whatever. But we are about beliefs, beliefs that change lives. And so we talked about our belief of what we believe about Trinity, what we believe about Jesus' return. Let's go to our next slide. We're going to read what we believe at our core. You can have a lot of extra stuff on this, but at our core, what do we believe about humanity? So you guys read this with me. We believe that all humans are created by God in His image. We believe that by nature and choice, we all have sinned against God and have brought judgment and condemnation upon ourselves. Amen. Does that sound really happy? No, there's a couple negative words in there. We're going to talk about those. It's important that we see the whole story, but know at the end, it's, it's not going to be all bad. It's not going to be all bad. I bet God can do something with rotten humanity. Um, but I want you to see in this belief statement, there are two parts that we're going to talk about. It says we're created by God in His image. image. So we're going to spend the first part of the sermon talking about that word. What does that mean? In His image. And then we're going to spend the next part talking about that word we all have <coughs> sin. We're going to talk about that idea. We're made in God's image. What do you got to know about humans? We're made in God's image, whatever that means. We'll talk about it. And we all have sinned, whatever that means. We're going to talk about that. So this idea of the image of God, open your Bible to Genesis 1. We'll go to our next slide. Genesis 1. Uh, in Genesis 1, how many days does it take God to create the world, the heavens and the earth? Yeah, it takes him six days, and on the seventh day, he rests. He rests. Okay, that's where we get the idea of Sabbath, six days of work, one day of rest. Um, but on, on the, the last day, God says something amazing that he says for no other creature, not puppies, not trees, not jellyfish. Um, he says something very unique. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's just one verse. So pause before we get to 27. It says in there, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness. And we've talked about before how this is also a promise of the Trinity. And we talked about Trinity. Is God ever going to disagree with himself? No. Are the, are the Father and the Son going to say, hey, today we're fighting? No. No. So they are in together in unity saying, let's make man in our image. And the first thing they say is that means let them have dominion. Who here used the word dominion this week? No, you usually don't use it. We're going to talk about what that word means. But see, that's, that's part of what image means. But then it continues on. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. He's going to say something new. In the image of God, he created them male and female he created them so we see this word whatever dominion means which we'll talk about in a second whatever dominion means uh god is saying that's part of being made in my image but also this idea of male and female which male and female we, we say we oftentimes whenever you're five years old do, do boys think that girls are great to hang out with no they say they have Cooties. They have cooties. But over the course of, of most people's lives, the idea of male and female is this idea of relationship. Can you guys say relationship? Relationship. relationship. So we see part of being in the image of God is this idea of dominion and this idea of relationship. Dominion and relationship. So let's uh, see how that plays out as we go through the Genesis story. Genesis 
One is this big 40,000 foot view flying really high. What does it look like for creation? You see like whole things made and, and there's, there's, there's oceans made. But Genesis 2 is a story on a very small scale of one family. Who's in that first family? What do you call them? Adam. Say it louder. Adam. Yeah, you guys got you to say things. You got to say things. Genesis 2, 19. Uh, let's go to this, uh, this next slide. This next slide. Genesis 2, 19. If you're in your Bible, just flip the page. So uh, there's that 40,000 view of creation, and then there's this zoomed-in view of creation. One guy one guy and in short god makes this garden he says i'm going to make this guy and it's, it's going to be a place for him but this is how i think of dominion a lot of people will say different ways but i'd rather use scripture uh to talk about it um so in genesis 2:19, uh we'll, we'll just start reading there now out of the ground the lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to who adam, adam or the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. That was its name. So the first job. It, did you know that? In the garden with Adam and Eve, did God say be lazy and eat uh, Cheetos all day? No. They had, they had work to do. They were supposed to tend to the garden. They were supposed to be in the garden. And most importantly, I don't know why... God can do whatever he wants, but he said, you know what? Let's, let's bring the animals to the man. Let's see what he creatively thinks of. This is part of dominion. God didn't make puppies and say puppies share in the, in the uh, governing and stewardship of creation. Unless you have a very special dog. Has he said that to any of your puppies? No. You may think they're special, but they, they don't help steward creation. But with humanity... For some reason, God has said, you are going to have dominion over this. You are going to influence this. And we see this not on the 500th page of the Bible, but on the second page of the Bible. God says, you are going to influence this. You're going to influence this. So this idea of dominion, some people say it's the word for stewardship, taking care of something, sort of like a shepherd takes care of sheep. Uh, I, I like the idea of creativity. Um, God says, let's, let's see what you do with this. Let's see what happens with this. Um, care, love, compassion. God wants us to take part in caring for it. That's why Adam and Eve's first job is a gardener. Is a gardener's job to kill all the plants? No, they, they tend to, to the garden. But uh, let's, let's continue on. That's that idea of dominion. Uh, let's go a couple verses down. Genesis 23, or Genesis 2, 23. So all the animals are made, and Adam names them all. And then God says, we need to do something here. We need something a little extra, something, some pizzazz. And uh, there's the first surgery that happens. And what are, what's the result of that, a man or a woman? a woman? A woman. And then verse 23, the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And verse 24 continues on with this promise. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And listen, this is the most important part for today. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. 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 So God made us for dominion. He made us also for relationship. He made us also for relationship. He didn't just make one guy and say, tend to dominion. I only want your creativity. I only want your stewardship. God has made each of us for relationship. I mean, you're in this room. You didn't intentionally go and lock yourself away on an island today. You must care for a couple human beings in the world. Is that right? Nod your head yes if you care for any other human beings in the world. Okay? It's it's part of who we are. And, and notice before, we're going to talk about how this gets messed up. It says, naked and were not ashamed. This is the idea there is nothing to hide. There is nothing to be afraid of. You've done this. Don't nod your head yes. But there are things that you have not told your spouse for any number of reasons. Either because it wasn't you were going to see if they ever found out. Don't, don't nod your head yes. I'm telling you, don't do it. <laughs> you, you either didn't want them to find out or you're, you're going to wait. It was a surprise. It's saying they have complete 
communication. There is no fear. Oh, what are they going to say about this? You know, I had to ask Allison this morning, you know, the, the tie. Should I do the tie? She said, she, she just humored me. She's like, sure, whatever. Yeah, wear the tie. <laughs> but we are made for relationship, complete community. And let me just ask you, you know, just to make sure you're seeing how this all connects, is where do we get the assurance that eternal community is possible? Do we get it from other humans? No, we get it from God. Trinity matters. It's important. God is in eternal harmony. There's the promise that there can be relationship between humans. All right. So that sounds great. God made you in His image. Dominion and relationship. You're going to go do that perfect now, right? No. no. Let's go to the next slide. What's that a picture of? The earth. All of you have only been on earth all of your life, right? Just making sure nobody's been everybody else. I mean, some humans have left Earth. Hmm. We got some statistics there. The human population in 1340 was 340 million. The reason I chose that date is because that was before the bubonic plague had entered Europe. So that was sort of a high point in human history. High point. That's a lot of people. Um, that's more than, than in Travis and Bastrop County for sure. Then in World War I, we had 38 million people not born, but killed. Killed. I mean, there were people outside of that. I'm sure some people died of starvation or exposure, but this was actual general versus general, you know, go, go destroy that village, go destroy that army. army. World War II, there's more of a range whenever they talk about these statistics because humans just sort of kill people for fun in that one. And some of it's hidden. But the guess is 50 to 80 million people died in those wars. So if you do the math, that means in just two wars, in just two wars, within 50 years, that would have wiped out one-third of the human population from that high point. And this is just uh, Wikipedia stuff. It may not be true, but they totaled it up. Not all war, not tribe versus tribe, not just like uh, stuff in the desert that we don't know about, but an actual general like, France versus Switzerland, whatever. Anything with an actual general. Some big wars in China. They estimate that there's been at least, on the low end, 314 million people killed in war. Now, if we had all those wars and all that death in 1340, would we have any humans left? Probably not. We'd be, re we'd be right on the edge. We, we would be better at killing each other than the bubonic plague. And that's what I want you to see. This, this is dark. It's not good. How are we doing... At Dominion, I would say that the most dangerous species for humans is humans. How are we doing with that creativity that God gave us, that stewardship that God gave us? You, Maybe not you and your individual life, maybe at moments, but it seems that humans are preoccupied with hurting each other, controlling each other, and harming each other. It's what we spend a lot of our time on. But that's easy for us to ignore. You know, we're not generals or, you know, big government figures. How are we doing at relationship? Oh, you have those. Really don't raise your hand here. But some of you, if I ask you what's the, the hardest thing in any given day, you're going to say some big stuff. You're going to say disease. You're going to say, I think I'm going to lose my job. You're, you're going to say the money situation. But a lot of you in here, would say, my relationship with that person. The thing that keeps you up at night is another person. Someone you're, probably someone you're supposed to be close to. You may say, oh, my boss, we, we've got a hard relationship. But some of you are going to say, it's my wife. It's my husband. It's that, that child, that sibling that I haven't talked to in years. Relationships are hard. We're usually not very good at them. So, dominion and relationship, the image of God. How are we doing? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Overall in human history, thumbs down. What is the problem? This isn't a very complex sermon. If you've ever been in church before, you know. Let's go to the next slide. We all have sin. I like how Linda says it. What, what do you say? Anything? You think, say, or do that does not please God. Anything you think, say, or do 
that does not please God. And Romans 3.23 promises us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of So you know, you know, you've heard this before. It's not complex, but I want you to see it another way from Romans 5, uh, just to just to give you something to chew on that's different. Who wrote Romans? Paul. And uh, Paul knew what it was like to be a sinner. I always like to remind people, the guy who wrote most of your New Testament used to be Christians before Jesus made him one. So if you think that stubborn person is never coming to Christ, well, there's Paul. Romans 5, starting in verse 12. Well, I'll, I'll set this up. So uh, Paul is, is trying to answer and, and talk about the question uh, if someone was asking him in his day in the first century. Okay, Paul, you're saying all have sinned. Romans 3.23 comes before Romans 5. All have sinned. What about, you know, what can there be sin without the law? It, how do we know if there's sin without the law? And this is what he says. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. What, what's that guy's name? The one man? Adam. Adam. And death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not countered, counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And now that's all the negative stuff. After that, he'll start to say some really exciting things. We'll talk about those next week. But here's, here's what he's saying. Someone asked Paul, how do you know that all have sinned? What's the, what's the biggest result of sin? Is it life or death? Yeah. Death. Paul is saying the symptom of the disease of sin is death. And Paul is asking his audience, just sort of like how I showed you, if you looked at humanity, is death among us? Not just that we die biologically, but it seems like there's just a deathliness. There, there is oppression. There is war. There is not good things among us. So if we have the symptom, do we have the disease? Yes. Yes. You don't have to ask somebody, hey, have you broken any of God's laws to know if they're a sinner or not? They're all a part of this big problem. This big problem. And so that's why Paul says in verse... 14, death reigned. Death reigned. And I'll tell you, I mean, next week we're talking about salvation. But is death going to reign forever? No. Death reigning implies that death acts like it's a king. What did the true king come to do? He came to destroy sin and death. Just come back next week. We'll get all excited about that. But if anybody says, no, I'm not sure that people sin. I don't think that anybody ever trespasses against God. Say, look at the world. Is this how it's supposed to be? Is this dominion? Is this a relationship? No. No. So let's go to our next slide. We all have sinned. And in our belief statement, we say in, in two Ways, two main ways. You could divide this out. What is sin like? What is sin like in my life? But two main ways. We sin by nature and by choice. And like last week, I had y'all look at like 15 different scripture passages. Instead of this time, let's just go to one guy who screws up a lot. Who here has heard of King David? If you've been coming on Wednesday night, we've been talking about King David and his mess for like three months now. King David is, a, is called a man after God's own heart. But he has one big thing that he messes up with. One big thing. He takes another guy's wife, sleeps with her, has a, has a child uh, uh, out of wedlock, tries to cover it up, tries to cover it up so much that he has that guy murdered. He's a, uh, David, King David, is a conspirator to murder. He tries to hide the child, which sort of means he's trying to be a deadbeat dad. And then he realizes his sin is terrible. His sin needs to have something happen. So David writes a psalm. He wrote a lot of psalms, but this one in Psalm 51 is a guy who knows that his sin is serious. Psalm 51, starting in verse 1. Yeah, okay, I got the, the cheat sheets right there, but you'll have to go to your Bible to read it. 
Psalm 51, verse 1. David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Does David ask for forgiveness for his sins? Yeah. And we just, just think about this. He is a king. He could sit on a gold throne all day and have people tell them, you, you do nothing wrong, you do nothing wrong, you're the king, you never make a mistake. But David the king writes this down and at some point passed it out for everybody to read. You talk about confession. You talk about openness, about his sin. But how is he open? He has two ways for us to think about this. In Psalm 51 verse 5, listen to this. You're going to answer the question, when does David think that he is a sinner? Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Does David think that he became a sinner, that he had the problem of sin start whenever he got his first job? No. Does David think that it started uh, whenever he got married? No. He didn't know how much he could screw up until he had a wife. No. He knew, he knew he was a sinner before that. David says that he is a sinner from birth. He is born with the disease of sin. And that can freak some people out, but let me put it in a more normal way. I don't have children. I'm going to in May, or I'll have a child. We'll work on children later. But if you have a child, did you have to teach them or train them in how to disobey? No. Were, you, were you going through the grocery aisle and saying, son, daughter, you have never taken candy from the grocery aisle, just so you know, you probably should. You, you, don't, you don't have to. You don't have to teach them on how to reach out and take what they want and say, this is mine. They just know. They, they know that they derive some pleasure from pushing their sister down. I, I was just at a playground yesterday, and children, they're terrible. They're so <laughs> selfish and, and mean. I had a little boy made my niece cry. <laughs> but we talked about forgiveness. But we are, we are sinful by nature. We are sinful by nature. And this is important because there, there are people, usually, usually uh, more, not, not from other religions, but people who are more uh, academic, they'll say, oh, well, if you just put people on an island and left them away from technology and society, they would be kind and compassionate. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't war. They wouldn't fight. There would be no sin. That's not the promise of Scripture, you know, that... The people in the in the Old Testament, the people of the tribe of Benjamin that we talked about running away with all the women, did they have cell phones and technology to teach them to be evil? No, they figured it out. They figured it out. But then the next part, David says, I'm sinful from birth. But he says in verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. Have I sinned. So David says, I was born with the disease, but it's my fault. I chose. I chose. And he more than anybody, he's the king. He doesn't even get the excuse of I was following orders. He just said, no, I was on the roof and I wanted that. He chose to sin. So you are born in sin. And yes, you've had circumstances in your past. Your parents did something. Uh, someone at your work uh, incites you to react a certain way. Yes, there are things in your life, but you are responsible for you. And I've got that, that phrase under there on the bottom, sort of a hillbilly statement. Has anyone ever heard, the devil made me do it? Well, here's, here's, that is not true. That is not true because if the devil made you do it, you can't be forgiven for it. You confess your sin. You don't make excuses for it. On the, on the day of judgment, who's sitting on the throne? King Jesus. King Jesus. And like the thief on the cross, you don't make excuses for yourself. You say, I deserve it. But Jesus, remember me. Jesus, forgive 
me. So let's go to our, our next slide. So we see that the reason we are not fully living up to the image of God, of dominion and relationship, is because of sin. And we personally know that we are sinners, but also just humanity in general. Is it evident that we are sinners? Yeah. Look around. Paul says it as death reigned. Death reigned. So I do want to say, before I talk about this idea of new dominion, if you would say, whoa, 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 pastor, I never knew I was a sinner. I never knew uh, there's this, this life and this forgiveness in Christ. You know, I, I, I quote to you all a lot, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you have a chance, not if you get your act together, but you will be saved. The judge desires to forgive, but you have to confess your sin to Him. You have to confess Him as Lord. We'll talk about that in a big way next week, talking about our belief statement of salvation. But today, you may say, it's bleak. I guess I'm just a human. I'm broken. I'm rotten. Has God given up on the image that He gave humanity? No. I bet God desires to see the image that He gave humanity fulfilled so much that He would die for it. He would come down and show us what it's supposed to be like. Well, He did. His name was Jesus. And He lived a perfect human life. Lived out the image of God, both in His dominion and the way that He was creative and the way that He was a steward over what He had, but also in His relationship. So that He could actually command people, love others as I have loved you. But what are some of the last words that Jesus tells His disciples, the people that are following Him? Does he say, hey, go shut yourself off and be a hermit? No. no. In Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Adam's first job was God was seeing what he would call the animals. If you're in Christ, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, your new image of God job is to tell others to call on Jesus. To tell others to call on Jesus. The animals won't save you. Jesus will. And Paul writes this in a beautiful way. He writes this in a beautiful way. 10.14 Romans 10.14 How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Paul knows humanity is messed up. Someone has to go spread the message. And here's the promise. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So don't be crippled today by this understanding that humanity has sinned, that we have failed to live up to the image of God because God died to forgive you and has given you a new mission. So as we get ready for our time of invitation,